Hi everybody, my name is Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today and this is your virtual star party for January 13th, 2013, the uh, I guess one year plus one month edition of the virtual star party. Uh, so uh, we've got a full house tonight, we've got a bunch of telescopes and we've got a bunch of, uh, of uh, commentators as well, but I think we've also got some news which is sort of a new addition that we wanted to add to the virtual star party which is a few special guests. So joining us uh, this week, we've got Amanda Bauer, who is located in uh, Sydney, Australia, and has been sort of providing the best coverage of these awful um, uh, fires that are happening in Australia. So we're going to get to Amanda in a few seconds, but before we do, I just want to introduce everybody else who's involved, and I'm just going to go sort of through this here. We've got, uh, we've got Bill McLaughlin, who's in Oregon, and you can see him. Right here <laughs> from the back. From the from his yeah from his command center and uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's got some great views for us tonight. We open with this beautiful view from Dave Dickinson, who's in Florida, and this is his uh, Jupiter. Hey. If you hear some smacking noises, that's because Dave is battling back the uh, the mosquitoes there in Florida. It's that warm. The air conditioner is uh, running right now too. You might hear it humming in the background. We got uh, we got Gary Ganella, who's in Los Angeles, and giving us this beautiful view of the Orion Nebula, which we'll be getting to in a second. We've got Nicole Gallucci. AKA the noisy astronomer out of the uh, back in uh, Edwardsville. Dr. Phil Plate, who joined us uh, last week and has come again this week, which is awesome, at his uh, freezing cold uh, center in uh, Boulder, Colorado, right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty chilly here today. I heard you uh, whining about that, so. We got if Roy I Salisbury. Swap a few degrees with Amanda, that would be awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> Roy Salisbury, who's in uh, Las Vegas and uh, operating his uh, robotic observatory. Um, and hopefully we're going to get some clear skies. We have to, mostly clouds for Roy, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, we got Scott Lewis, who is in uh, Los Angeles. Yep. And we got Thad Zabo, who's also in Los Angeles. And if we're lucky, um, Ray Sanders is going to join us partway through. He's located in, um, where is it? He's at the Vatican Observatory. Pope Scope. AKA the Pope Scope. So <laughs> this Arizona. Is a, this is a, a two meter telescope that he's going to be trying to bring to the uh, bring to the party, which will be amazing if it happens. But uh, there's going to be some technical issues, I'm certain. So uh, is that the biggest telescope we've ever had? Scope too. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that's by a factor of a hundred. So yeah. Cool. That's going to be fantastic. That was highly scientific. Estimate, yeah, wasn't that was it? that was my measure. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Well, so let's get rolling with Amanda then. And so, Amanda, can you give us an update on this uh, on these fires? What's going on in Australia? Uh, yeah. So yesterday, local time, uh, about four p.m., fire started to sweep through uh, Siding Spring Observatory, which caused quite a bit of um, well scare. Luckily, all of the people and the staff from the observatory were evacuated from the, the fire service had announced that. So everyone, um, human life is fine, no one's injured, uh, but we were able to monitor what was going on during the, the heat rise from some of the, the weather telescopes that they had out there. So some peak temperatures, it reached about 212 degrees Fahrenheit for a few minutes and then dropped back down. That was right when the main fire swept through. But then smaller little brush fires uh, kept up on the mountain uh, around different buildings throughout the night. So we've all been pretty nervous. At the moment, the current status is that people are on site. Uh, the buildings that house the telescopes, there's, um, there's about 12 telescopes up there, including the largest optical telescope that Australia has, the 4-meter Anglo-Australian telescope. All of the buildings, the structures actually look fine, so the, the fire hasn't damaged the telescope facilities as far as the, the outsides go. Um, and we're currently assessing what the extent of the damage is as far as the electronics. So some buildings up there were uh, completely devastated, like the lodge where astronomers sleep. I saw some of the aerial photos from, from helicopters and you can see all the rooms that I sleep in when I go up there. Um, so that's wiped out. But people are okay. The, the hardware structure seems to be okay. Uh, we're just not sure about the actual instrumentation and things like that yet. Well, I know that when they, uh, the last fire came through about 10 years ago, the one that really devastated uh, another observatory, they put in a bunch of precautions in place to stop that from, from happening again or try and minimize the damage if there was a future fire. So do you think that, that helped out this time around? I think it certainly did. Um, I mean, time will tell, but they've been able to put up 
kind of fire retardant paint around the domes, and then some of the, the buildings also have ember guards, so that any of the embers that are flying that tend to more quickly spread the fires, uh, they were able to stop those from, from spreading as quickly, anyway. Um, it's hard to tell exactly what, what those preventative measures might have um, helped or not helped, but at the moment we know that we still have telescopes up there and it's not as devastating as what Mount Stromboli was, so that's, that's good news. Yeah. I'm, Scott's uh, displaying a bunch of pictures here, so you can see this. Just these. These are all some pictures that we pulled from your blog. Oh, look at that! Mm. <clears throat> it's pretty and stunning. The wildfires are ridiculous. I mean, having been a firefighter, it's it's so difficult to 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 even try to contain because there's so many factors involved, so many variables involved in trying to even approach it, even defensively. So it just reminds me a lot of the the fires that went up around here by Mount Wilson too. It came dangerously, dangerously close to just destroying the Mount Wilson Observatory. So uh, I'm glad that everyone got, got out safe and that they're able to at least, uh, you know, you said that earlier that the people are starting to come back or at least making sure that nothing's been completely destroyed, but it's, it's terrifying and it's really, it's, you, you, there's really nothing that you can do besides try to build best defense from having nature take over. Yeah, and you can do as much as you want, as much as you think it's going to help, but it is an amazingly powerful force <laughs> that goes through. I had never really witnessed one. Um, this is a bit of a unique case because we could really watch it almost live from webcams, for better or worse. So that helped raise my anxiety quite a bit, but um, I think they've, they've done a lot to help prevent this completely wiping out the observatory, and I think that needs to be appreciated. The fire service really did an amazing job. To put this in perspective, uh, in 2003, what, what Fraser alluded to a few minutes ago, fires swept through Mount Stromlo, which is another great observatory in Australia, and I was there a year later, I uh, happened to be visiting Australia, and we went there, and it was unbelievable. Um, there, the domes were, uh, things were destroyed. It was like somebody dropped a bomb on the place. And one of the, the memories that I've, I've been left with very strongly is a, a big telescope. You know, they're not like solid pieces. They're made of uh, grid work of, of girders and steel and that sort of thing. And the telescope got so hot that the metal softened and the whole thing just sagged. And so this, this, this whole thing had just been like somebody taking a blowtorch to it, which I guess is really what had happened. And um, there were flies everywhere because the ecosystem had been totally disrupted. So even a year later... All the trees were burned because they're eucalyptus. They burn like like blowtorches, and it was just the devastation was horrifying. And uh, those are telescopes that have been used for decades and are destroyed. They're gone. They're never going. They can be rebuilt, but not the same way. So to have Sighting Springs, which is another major global level, you know, great observatory, to have that spared uh, with the damage it had uh, is is amazing. And actually, it's it's good. It's it's good. I mean, it's bad, but it's good that it, it stopped where it did. Right. Yeah. Well, and I know you've got to run, Amanda. So uh, so thank you very much for giving us the the update. And I hope we can see you uh, another time on on better circumstances. Bring <laughs> bring one of those telescopes to the party. That would be great. Right. Thanks for having me. <laughs> see you later. Bye, guys. All right. Bye, Amanda. Okay. See you, Amanda. You can follow Amanda on Twitter on Astro Pixie. That's her. Uh, that's her Twitter handle. Right. And amazing put her blog, blog up and yeah, yeah. put her blog yeah. up in yeah. the event comments there. You can well. get all the links to her from there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, well let's get on with the actual uh, the actual party itself. So so like I said, we've got uh, four working telescopes tonight. Uh, we've got Bill, we've got Dave, we've got Gary, and we've got uh, Roy. Now Roy says that he's got a lot of clouds, so we'll see how how well we do. So first, I think we'll just start with with this picture from Bill. Which, Bill, you have you have accomplished one of our sort of bucket list here on the Virtual Star Party, and I don't think you even realized it. No, by accident. I mean, um, I tried a couple of weeks ago putting my DSLR. I, I, I've had the DSLR since summer, but uh, hadn't tried putting it on the scope because I had to get an adapter made for it to fit it on the uh, the 500 millimeter FSQ. So it's it's a Canon 5D Mark III on a uh, FSQ 106, which is a 500 millimeter focal length, and it's uh, two minutes at ASA 3200. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, you know, it's good if you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> a little um, noise reduction in Photoshop and crop right. it, but... Um, but the, but most importantly, I mean, this is just one straight exposure, two minutes with the uh, the camera, and you got Pleiades, which people yeah, have been and asking. Not too bad. I mean, not, yeah. it doesn't compare to you know a long multiple exposure one, but it's not bad at all for for oh, what it is. Oh, it's gorgeous, and That's it's terrific. It's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Stop being so modest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, only only by comparison to 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 what I normally would try to do, you know, with the longer exposures and in the dedicated astro cameras. I can't help. I'm amazing all the time. I. How amazing do you want me to be today? That's that's. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. I I'll, I will then. No. Yeah, it's, but okay. people have been asking, you know, someone to be able to bring Pleiades in and get the whole thing yeah. and to see the nebulosity. Like I said, you have uh, completed a chunk of our bucket list, so I think we can all die happy now. Um, but uh, oh, and oh, by the way, <laughs> but uh, but right. So just to remind people, um, if you want to. Uh, if you want to be able to ask us questions, uh, by all means. If you want to uh, ask, make some requests. I think we've got we've got a pretty responsive set of telescopes tonight, so I think we'll be able to, to fulfill people's requests. And I know, uh, I know, Bill and uh, Gary usually have a big list, so we'll be able to work through that as well. Um, so there's a few ways you can do that. Uh, you can uh, post a comment on the event page on Google Plus. Uh, you can post on Twitter using the hashtag Star Party. Uh, you can also just post if you see where I started the feed up in uh, on my page. And then the last place, and I'll say right now, this is probably the best place, um, is to make your comments over on YouTube. We're most likely to see the comments over on YouTube. So if you're watching the video embedded somewhere, click to watch it on YouTube, and then you'll see all the comments pouring down on YouTube, and then and then you can jump in and uh, and post your comments there. So that would be great. Um, okay, great. So yeah, so if you want to see some objects now, um, we're going to be probably not going to be able to get the moon. I don't know. Can you see the moon tonight, Bill? Uh, it's probably too far off to the west. I think my roof is blocking it. Okay, all right. Yeah, so it's a really nice thin crescent moon. I was hoping that we might be able to get to see it, but um, I know it's already gone down for David, who's in, who's in Florida. But if so. you get the phases of the moon app from the yeah. universe today. I was, was going to show that. Yeah, I'll show that in a second. <laughs> I don't want to, you know. Oh, I don't want to. I'll, I'll do yeah. shameless plugs for you, Fraser. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'll, I'll shameless plug in a second. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on. Uh, so, Gary Ganella. Oh, Gary, what have we got here? This is Orion. Everybody's oh, been asking for this for the last eight or nine months. This is a uh, four-minute exposure with no binning. So, wow. is this our first Orion sighting of the season? The first one, as far as I know. I think. I think we had one last week, but it was uh, from from someone on the East Coast. Like I think uh, uh, Mark was working on it. But um, sorry, you but, lose, Gary. Yeah, Gary. Uh, you, yeah, might, you, might a, you might have missed it. Might have missed it. But but still, uh, this is fantastic. That's great, and you can see the all that nebulosity. Wow. It's so, too I mean, bright, actually. That, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you have the, the trapezium, these these four extremely bright stars, uh, one of which is an O-class star. In fact, I, I think it's an O-4. So if we're talking about stellar classification, zero is the highest, nine is the lowest, O is the highest of all classifications. So, so an O-4, I think, is, is about the... Um, brightest, most luminous main ma main sequence star that I, I know of uh, out there. And so that's what's powering this. And so when you see that that glow in the middle, um, you know, this is coming from one of the, the hottest, largest stars that we, we know of. In fact, this is this is uh, such an incredibly intense glow from it. I can show my students from a, a campus that's uh, surrounded by Long Beach, Anaheim, and Los Angeles on, on three different sides of it. Uh, this is the one deep sky object that will show up even for, for students there. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. And we were joined by Dr. Pamela Gay. Pamela! Mm -hmm. Yay. I, I think we have the Hi, H crew sorry on for all the fail joining. I uh, turned on the heat in my attic and blew the circuit breaker. So Oops. I think nice. all the awesomeness of this star party was just enough that it didn't need the heat of the, the, the ceramic heater. Yeah, I'm. I, as always, my... My basement is extremely cold, but I, you know, I'll just tough it out. I put on a whole bunch of layers, so I'm okay. Well, you I live put the space heater on. I, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm Canadian in glue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on. Before, here's Roy's, um, what do you got, Roy? 
Yes, that's uh, M33. Nice. Gorgeous. Nice. And here's you're one saying, of uh, you're, you're saying you're getting clouds, but I I see a beautiful uh, galaxy and a satellite moving through. Yeah. What kind yeah, of galaxy is it, guys? It's a flocculent oh, galaxy. galaxy. <laughs> I was just going to say it was big. It is big. It's bigger than I am. Oh, it's not that's, that big. It's galaxies that's go. A, that's actually a five minute exposure. Wow. Yeah, it's not a it's not a dwarf galaxy, but it's not a large spiral galaxy. But this is another one of those objects that people were were uh, nagging us about, and and now we're now getting you see the, why. And now <laughs> we're getting well, no, but now we're getting yeah, absolutely. But we're getting the winter constellations now, so we can we can really show these objects in the in the star party. But now they're going to ask for the Eagle Nebula and, and the, the Rain Trifid Nebula and, and, and yeah. the Trifid, and they're all gone. They'll so. Never be satisfied. <laughs> Please that sky it just keeps rotating. Yeah, <laughs> but this is a great example of a uh, of a nice sort of face-on spiral. And this is, I mean, this is part of the local group. If you want to know our neighborhood in space, then you know the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy, and M33. And yeah, there's, you know, a couple tens of dwarf galaxies around also. And eh, I can't really diss them. I mean, the large and small metal line of clouds are pretty awesome. They but, whistle um, why they work. That's what I heard. <laughs> I love the concept of dissing on galaxies. <laughs> so... But uh, but yeah, this you know if you're, if you're talking the the three that really kind of stand out in the the local group here, this is uh, M33 is one of them. Yeah, and and in another four billion years or so, Andromeda and Milky Way are going to come to a head-on collision, and Triangulum's going to kind of spiral in there as well and pop in, and make this this big elliptical galaxy out of the three spirals. A, a, a collision, because we don't mean collision like exploding. Yeah, it's a lot of the stars are just gonna miss because there's so much space. There's... All of them are gonna miss each other. Yeah. And and the dark matter is gonna miss each other because it just refuses to interact. It's antisocial well, the... that way. It's the gas and the dust that gets in on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they're so underground. It's like the hipster mass. I'm like, yeah, we're <laughs> we're not even getting close. It's too mainstream. <laughs> way too mainstream. We were hanging out with you before the reionization happened, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still on live journal. Cool. Yeah, I was an M dwarf before it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the main sequence. Yeah, oh, yeah. Someone just right. hashtag hipster <laughs> astronomy. We did All right. Before. Well, thank you, every, everyone. We'll see you next week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was clearly turned more into party than Star. So why don't we? We'll, uh, let's let's move. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna appreciate what Dave uh, what Dave's got going on with Jupiter here. Now, Dave, you had. Oh, I can see. Actually, there's a moon flashing a little bit off to the right there. Yeah, there's Ganymede just off uh, on the right side, left side of the screen here, uh, and the other three Galilean moons are just out of view. Uh, Callisto, Io, and Europa. Now they're out of the field of view, or or just out of the like the the. They're out of the camera's view. Yeah. The camera's view is pretty narrow. It's about maybe about ten arc minutes by ten arc minutes. It's a very narrow field of view with this webcam, so uh, I might be able to pan over to them. I just learned something the other day. Uh, I knew Callisto doesn't always do shadow transits, but we're going to start having a series of shadow transits by Callisto in July of this year that uh, Jupiter, the, the orbit of the moons is going to start becoming edge-on again through to 2014. Oh, so it's like, it has to do with the, just like the, the way we're seeing the tilt of Jupiter and the tilt yeah. of, they're, of Earth they're, coming together. Yeah. They're tilted only by a few degrees. They're, they're not tilted by much in relation to the ecliptic, but they're tilted just enough that Cal uh, Callisto doesn't always uh, shadow transit. I, didn't, uh, I knew that was the case, but I didn't realize we were coming up on that again this, uh, in a few months. The way to think of it is we don't get a, a lunar or solar eclipse every single month, and when you have a shadow transit, that's a solar eclipse. So it's, it's just as unlikely in many cases for these distant moons to not shadow transit as for our own moon to not shadow transit or eclipse. Well, it's also like how we get that changing view of the rings of Saturn. So, you know, sometimes we see the Saturn's yeah. rings really face on, and, and then other times we see it just as this line that runs across the planet. So, of course, it is something to note with. Sorry, uh, 
something to note with, with Jupiter, because, I mean, on Earth, you get a potential eclipse season about every six months. Um, for Jupiter, because its orbit takes 12 years, you'd get it just about every six years for Callisto. The other moons are close enough, you get shadow transits practically all the time. But Callisto is uh, so far out there that it's going to be about once every six years. So this is, hey, kind of special coming up for Jupiter at the uh, end of uh, uh, 2013 here. So. I, I can tell when I'm observing, too, that the, the shadows of the moons, they look different. Callisto has a very tiny, tiny dark shadow. Eo, Io, Eo has a very big shadow compared to the, there, there's a difference in the size of the shadows on the disk. Now, i got a question from Kyle Archie on, on YouTube, and this I think might be for, for Thad. Um, now that, uh, that Jupiter's in the spotlight, is there any news of Jupiter's blue spot that we were seeing last week? So I don't know if you saw this. There was a sort of a blue region that was uh, image in um, in Mike's image, and and any idea what was causing that? Um, really, I haven't. I was hey, I was I was hanging out with Pamela no. and Nicole and Scott. So but, um, <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, Phil, but, you were here. But, do you remember who was calling it? I mean, I don't even remember. Festoon. What Festoon. Festoon. Yeah. yeah. So Festoon, not a barge, right? Because yes. I've I've seen some people making comments about some barges. So this was in the equatorial belt. It was in the, the, I guess, the top one, yeah. I'm not sure. I think it's in the south equatorial belt, yeah, the dark one. Okay. And hanging off into the equatorial region or farther I, south? I think it was right on the border. Christopher Goh, who uh, is mm -hmm. another uh, astronomer who takes phenomenal images of Jupiter and has discovered a couple, at least one impact on Jupiter, was posting some pictures on Facebook of it. I could probably, um, mm. could probably find it pretty quickly. I just I saw it either today or yesterday. When you work from home, you kind of lose track of the days. But it's one of those things that you never hear about the you know a feature like that, and then when you know it gets brought up, then you see it everywhere. So, so is this a stacked photo from Mike, or was that a live image showing the festoon? We were seeing it live. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Um, let me screen share. Do I click the button that says screen share, or is that going to crash the whole system? It might. You're good. It yeah. should be cool. But while you do that, I'm going to drop out because Ray's going to hop in because we're at our max right now. So I'm going to send him in, and I'll be back in a little bit, guys. Awesome. Bye. Okay, the picture. Oh, wow, that is enormous. <gasps> yeah, now that's yeah. this picture was taken through a 2.4 meter telescope. Christopher Go uh, processed it apparently, and you can see it right here. It's this huge long storm. I think you can probably see my cursor, right? Yeah. So you got the red spot here, and you've got you know these things going around it, and all kinds of craziness. And here's this lovely long bluish whatever the heck this is. And you see little ones like this, and different spots and things. But this thing's really big. And you got to realize, you know, the, the the Earth isn't much bigger than my cursor there. A little bit bigger, but not much. Right. So I mean, yeah. that's a that's a big deal right there. And so that's what we were seeing last uh, last week. I, I would even go so far as to say we discovered it. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? So, uh, so maybe maybe you, I wouldn't go that far. When, when you get these bands, basically what's happening is the storm is so turbulent that it's stirring up materials from lower levels that reflect different colors of light than what we normally see. And uh, just like you might see a stream go from blue to muddy brown when things get stirred up from down below with the storms on Jupiter, you can see them change color as well when materials get mixed and changed. Now, Scott had to jump out because Ray is going to be trying to join us here, so we're going to move through some of the other objects as well. So let's go over to what Bill's got again. Oh, well, look at this. Bill and Gary have the same object. Same object. Ah. Check it out. Okay. But when we get color from a DSLR, and the other one is hydrogen alpha from, uh, from Gary. So, but uh, this is the flame nebula, which is to the, uh, just below that very bright star there, and uh, that's NGC 2024. And then off to the right of it is the Horsehead Nebula and the Emission Nebula uh, with the dark nebula in front and that famous Horsehead shape. And there's also Reflection Nebulae going on here. So if you look at the star that's kind of in between the bright one, which is al Natak, the star at the far eastern end of Orion's belt, and the little indentation from the Horsehead, the star below that actually has dust around it that's scattering blue light. So lots of color, lots of stuff going on in this photo. Wow, wow, just fantastic. Now, just really... for comparison, what, what are your two different size telescopes, your two different exposure times? Uh, mine was three minutes uh, with the uh, 500 millimeter uh, Takahashi and uh, DSLR. 
Okay. And mine is a two minute bend four by four and um, with my 14 inch scope. So it's about a degree wide, a degree and a half wide by a degree high. Wow. And what's surprising me a little bit, and I'm looking at Gary's view here, and just below and to the left of the horse head, that star that's showing up nice and with that blue glow around it in um, in Ray's view is actually showing up some in Gary's view as well. And typically dust doesn't show up in hydrogen alpha, so there has to be some extra uh, hydrogen hanging around that star there that is... Um, being excited, yay! By the uh, the emission coming from uh, from that star. Also, it just it wouldn't show up in Gary's view at all because uh, it's an ionization zone around the bright star. Yeah. So the, this is one of those things that happens with the really bright stars, and we just never noticed it in the beautiful reflection nebula before. I'm just going to go on record and say I cannot believe a year into this how wonderful the pictures are that we're able to to bring in in real time. It's unbelievable. Thank you so much. Guys, this is just amazing. You're all very welcome. Uh, Ray, what's the news? The news is I've arrived. Uh, Scott was nice enough to uh, bop out for a second. And, yeah, I'm live here from the Vatican Advanced Telescope in uh, Mount Graham, Arizona. And I've got a few images that I grabbed real quick from the telescope just to kind of show everyone. Oh, that'd so, be great. Can you tell um, us a little bit about the Pope scope? <laughs> I can talk about the Pope scope. <laughs> And I will gladly talk about the Pope scope. Uh, it was built in 1993. That's when they had first light. It's a 1.83 meter telescope. Uh, it uses a Gregorian focus, which is something I've been actually kind of learning about here and using different telescopes. Uh, the nice thing about this instrument is that there's a hole in the, um, the primary mirror and the light is actually sent down through there to all of the instruments. Uh, the instrument we're using tonight is called the 4K imager. Um, we have filter wheels. Unfortunately, the amount of time that it takes to process science images is a lot longer than the images from all of our regular telescopes. So um, I'm not able to give full color images tonight. However, I am collecting RGB and can throw them together and have an update next week. And so and nobody else thinks it's funny that that's a Gregorian telescope. <laughs> I, I of yeah. as well. <laughs> I honestly was waiting Excellent. for Phil or Nicole to start chanting while I was talking about the Gregorian focus. <laughs> well, actually, to celebrate, I mean, I do have, I do have my little hood here. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I forgot to bring like little stuff to like, you know. Anyways, log yourself with you. <laughs> That's so a really fast <laughs> primary on that scope, isn't it? It's like um, an yeah, F1. it's one. It is an F1, and it is uh, ridiculously fast, and um, so it's got a pretty wide field, but with the imager on it, it's only providing images that are uh, 12 arc minutes by 12 arc minutes. So I'll show here in a second. Um, let me pull this up here. Um, I have you, got you, you had a picture you shared of the scope itself. I don't know if you can share that as well, just so people um, can Yeah, I will definitely do that, um, the one that I posted on. Let me switch back over to that real quick. I've got a diagram um, of what he was talking about. I didn't oh, that's insane. Dang. <laughs> so let me, um, I'll share one image here real quick, and then I'll go back. Um, this is the trapezium in M42 that everybody's familiar with. Uh, this is a one-second exposure. Look at the spikes. <laughs> a one <laughs> second exposure. Dead. One second exposure off of a 1.83 meter F1 telescope. Um, earlier, uh, while we were doing our focus tests and everything, I tried to pull up Andromeda. And I'll show you Andromeda. Um, this is kind of tweaked around to show some highlights and colors and everything. Uh, so for those of you playing along at home, the lower the F number, the shorter an exposure time you need to get glorious detail. Wow. So for those of you who are familiar with the, uh, Blown out. <laughs> with yeah. the Andromeda, um, this is basically the core of Andromeda. And how many seconds was this one again? That was 25 seconds. Ago. This is 25 seconds on Andromeda, and this is basically the central core region. Um, we tried to indulge everyone with another image of Jupiter, and as you can imagine, that turned out less than favorable. And <laughs> I'll show you guys the glorious disaster that was Jupiter. Um, just hang on one second here. 
Yeah. Okay, it, is, when you're done with this, you need to explain what you should be doing with this telescope because you've done a great job demonstrating what you shouldn't be doing with this. <laughs> how, to, how to ruin a yeah, two-meter telescope. Talk about the research you're actually doing. <laughs> I will definitely do that. Yeah. I, we took aside a few minutes That's to fantastic. to indulge the VSP with, with mm. uh, you know, this. But, yes, uh, this is a half second on Jupiter. So can you tell people what those spikes are? Do you tell people what those spikes are? That's the diffraction spikes from the support for yeah, the... Oh, that's actually not no, diffraction. Yeah. That's not. There's that's diffraction. Over, that's you repair the, the, the hole you burned in the detector. <laughs> yeah, also... no, no, that's... So, so, Ray, to the oh. left, that's a dis diffraction spike. Oh, up and down, you actually uh, overfilled your pixels. I Which wasn't sure which ones you guys were asking, asking about. Yes, oh, yeah. that's yeah. vertical yeah. under blooming. into other pixel wells. Blooming, yeah. thank you. I couldn't remember the name. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said blooming. So, yes, what we should be doing and what we are doing with this is... Uh, Break all the CCD pixels. <laughs> <laughs> we're not breaking pixels. Um, no, you just uh, have to flush it out two or three times to get it back to sensitivity. Yeah. But uh, basically what we're doing is kind of a, an exploratory mission in looking at uh, several different stars that we've built up uh, for a target list to try and find um, companions to those stars. And also this is for us to get to learn how to use the 4K imager and how to use the instrument as well. So uh, we're planning some follow-up observations with this uh, instrument and this uh, telescope later on in the year. This is more kind of a getting used to the instrument. And as Pamela clearly pointed out, what not to do and what to do with the instrument. Totally so, different targets with a bigger telescope. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You can't yeah. do the kind of stuff that, you know, doing any of the planets. I mean, I even think maybe if we tried to pull up Neptune, um, that would probably be uh, somewhat faint. Though. Now my, now 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 the postdoc I'm working with is trying to check and see if we can pull up Neptune. Yeah, <laughs> I think I saw Neptune tune through a 30-inch totally telescope um, with yep. my piece, and it looks it looks great. <laughs> and F1 though, it's going to be tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah. Not take much of the field of view. So, yeah. so Ray, were were you taking these destructive images during twilight time? Uh, during our focusing and when we're setting yeah. up everything. So we did those about like an hour ago, just as it got dark enough for us to take those images and have them actually uh, turn out. So, um, so, so this, is, this is a completely normal use of time. This is not wasting telescope time for any of you at home that are worried. This is, <laughs> no. this is the frustration between sun went down it looks dark, but it's not scientifically because your objects are so faint that you're trying to use for science. So you get to play with the telescope while you're waiting for the sky to get fully dark. Um, it's, it's the difference between twilight by eye and the end of astronomical twilight. Right. And uh, part of uh, what uh, the postdoc that I work with, uh, why he always images the trapezium is because the distances between the bright stars and the trapezium are known. So that gives a good idea of the uh, image mm -hmm. scale for the images. So doing the trapezium, uh, again, not even really a waste of our time. That's something we actually do on any instrument that we work with is uh, to try and get that. So can you? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Ray. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were done. No, um, no you're fine. Can you put the trapezium picture back up for a sec. I certainly can. We saw. We had a shot of Orion earlier. This is the Orion Nebula. Orion's a constellation, and we had a shot of this. And those four stars that you see over on the right there, the bright one with the spikes through it and the three next to it, were overexposed. And you just saw a big glow in the middle there. Um, those four stars are what are called the trapezium. And the bright one there, they, they, they all have the collective name of Theta 1 Orionis, Theta, Greek letter 1. And then Orionis is the possessive form of the constellation. And all four of these stars are actually... Um, uh, O or B type stars. They're the most massive, most luminous, most energetic type of stars we know of. All four of these stars will one day explode. Um, probably the bright one, which is Theta 1 Orionis C, <laughs> you can look all this stuff up, um, is the most massive. It's about 40 times the mass of the sun. It's incredibly luminous. I mean, we're talking about a star 1,500 light years away that is essentially visible to the naked eye, barely, but. Uh, uh, it's sort of all lost in the glow of the nebula and the other stars and everything. Uh, but, you know, these are, these are going to blow up. They won't hurt us, but at that distance, they'll be very bright, brighter than Venus probably, or about as bright as Venus. And uh, the, that expanding debris will interact with the gas in the nebula, and who knows what will happen then. Um, hopefully, you know, I'd, I'd love to see that happen soon. 
Um, but we Hurry probably up, have stars. a few thousand years, so don't don't sweat You're it. You're such a super supernova lover. He is. Oh yeah, yeah. I wish oh, all stars blue. That'd be awesome. Well, that's great. So, so and so, are you starting to do your observations then? When does that kind of begin tonight? Um, we're actually going to be doing that here in about ten or fifteen minutes. Um, my uh, postdoc that I'm working with is already starting to line up our target list and getting going. We were able to carve out like fifteen or twenty minutes to jump in for this wow, here real fantastic. quick and show a few images. So, um, anyways, yeah, next week I'll try and jump in. Um, you know, because being in in the VSP and everything, but I'll try and um, have some color calibrated images and a little bit oh, prettier would be than these raw, uh, rather than raw science images from from the detector that haven't even been, you know, no no flats or anything applied. So, yeah, that would be fantastic. All right, well, thanks I a lot, Ray. Can I it first? Yep. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm getting back to not breaking the instrument. So <laughs> I'll see everybody right. next week. <laughs> thanks. We'll see you later. Thanks, guys. Right, Ray, thanks for sharing that. Enjoy. Yeah. yeah. No problem. So yeah, to repeat for for uh, Chris Caesar, since we all kind of um, on Twitter asking why are only one second shots overexposed in this case, and because we all went, oh my god, stuff. Uh, we probably didn't. <laughs> yeah, didn't explain very well. The telescope he's using using is huge. It's like two meters across. Yeah, the year. hold your arms out. Which for a professional bucket. astronomer is tiny. Right, That's the right. funny part. But Aww. so you, yeah, so the bigger the bucket, the more raindrops you collect in a shorter amount of time. And raindrops means photons, particles of light. Uh, so you collect a lot more light in a shorter time uh, with a huge telescope, research grade telescope like what Ray's using. So yeah, and he can't see the, the typical that. things. Um, there's more to it than that too. Is that it's it has a low f number, and the f ratio <laughs> is basically how quickly that light comes to focus. And it's, it's in units of the size of the mirror. So if you have an F1 telescope, that means it takes all that light and focuses it at a distance from the mirror that's the same as the width of the mirror. So you're taking all that light and focusing it very quickly. If it has a much larger F number, like telescopes I've used, like F10, F20, then that, that goes way out. You get really long telescopes. You use mirrors that bend the light up. Oh, so well, we lost. Those are called well, slow so spread the light out more, so it takes a longer exposure to see faint objects. And, and to look at this another way that, that might help understanding why, why this affects um, exposure times, when you have a short focus distance, you end up with um, smaller images, less magnification, so you end up seeing more of the sky per field of view. Well, if all the light from Jupiter is confined to a smaller number of pixels, all that light is confined to a smaller number of pixels and the pixels blow up faster. If you have a long focus number, the light gets spread out over a large area, so you end up with a very, very detailed image of Jupiter, but because the light is spread out across more pixels, it takes longer to get the same amount of light per pixel. Each pixel has a limit to how many photons it can detect before it blows out and becomes that, that you know, leaks out and becomes that white streak that we saw, which somebody pointed out was blooming. All and, the fun and, things you learn in your observing class. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the light typically only likes to spill out along either the rows or the columns, depending on the orientation of the readout of the electronics, yada, yada, yada. So, so that's where you get things leading along one direction. All right, well, let's move on. <laughs> um, I, I will expect everyone to uh, take the quiz tomorrow. So um, Everything I, I know about CCDs, which isn't much, this, came from this book. This will all be on the test. So um, flocculent. So and you, can, you can even study. I have a book. I have a book you can study from. This is what we used. It's the Handbook of CCD Astronomy by Steve Howell. Um, this was when I was a grad student in, like, 2005 or 2006. I don't know if this is still, like... The popular book. Dad's making noises over there. I'm, I'm making noises because I was looking at Ray's. Um, it looks like the Sculptor Galaxy NGC 253. This, one's, and, oh, okay. this was Bill's, yeah. That's mine, yeah. It's Bill. 253. It was pretty low, um, but uh, it came out not too bad for two minutes. Not too bad. Again. Uh, you know. <laughs> you know it's just, for it's being amazing in every galaxy. way, I suppose. Now, I did yeah. see a poster on this one at Double AS because apparently this is a starburst galaxy. This meaning that it comes in strawberry or lemon or no, wait, no, never. <laughs> yes, not it. It's a <laughs> galaxy that has a <laughs> massive amount of star formation. If you look at our Milky Way, it maybe forms about one star a year. And that's kind of typical for a spiral galaxy. You get a starburst galaxy, and the rate of star formation is closer to, say, 100 
stars a year. And so that's one thing that's that's going on in this galaxy. The other thing is that it's, a, I believe, a hidden active galactic nucleus, um, that there is a black hole in the middle there. It's feeding, but there's so much going around it that we don't see a jet. We don't see some of the typical things for when a, one of these supermassive black holes is, is eating stuff actively. So, um, yeah, if, if I remember correctly from that poster, it's actually also a hidden AGN, hidden active galactic nucleus. What kind of what kind of observations was that based on? Was it optical? Was it infrared? Was it... Oh, Nicole, I looked at so many posters. How much? I, know, I, I Yeah, I, I really, I can't remember. <laughs> she's she's, she's hoping for radio. She's like, come on, radio, she's radio please. She's hoping for radio. To, please to be radio. AGN, ah, to confirm AGNs, people almost always look in x-rays, because that's kind of the dead giveaway that you have something truly high energy going on. And with starbursters, the radio is a confusing factor, because yeah, if you yeah. have that much starburst, um, you have all these young T-Tories and all these these young wolf rays and all these young stars giving off radio jets of their own and so starburst galaxies are radioactive in their own little way. That well, I'm gonna... gone already, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's back back. yeah so, we've, so we've moved on. Um, Man, so we've moved on to uh, cool stuff Gary's I want to say. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> There's cool stuff I want to say. Well, gonna... you're going to have to say really cool stuff <laughs> about the Rosette Nebula. Then, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we've moved on to Gary's uh, Rosette Nebula. which is matches my seven. hair. Oh, wait, which, no. as everybody knows, <laughs> is, uh, is my favorite. Wrong nebula. Right Wrong away. one. <laughs> yep, that's Rosette. Tell us. <laughs> Explain. Go, Phil. So, go, Phil. <laughs> go what is it? What are no, we looking no, at? Phil. I'm done. No. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and be petulant now. <laughs> that's <too> bad. <laughs> well, okay, we can depend on Thad. Thad, what is this? <laughs> okay. so, Thad's not a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Like the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, you just haven't hung out with me long enough yet. But anyway, um, we're, like, we're looking at a hydrogen emission area. So this is, uh, you know, again, hydrogen gas. There are some extremely large bright stars in here. They get the electrons to knock out from the protons in the gas there. And as they recombine, the electrons drop down energy level. As they do, so they give off this light. And so hydrogen alpha is looking at one particular wavelength that happens as the electrons try and get nice and cozy with the, the nucleus as much as they can again. And um, so, yeah, so this that's the main bit of the glow here. Now, you also see some dark nebulae, some cold, dark molecular clouds kind of um, imprinted because they're in front of the nebula from our perspective here. And you've got this massive star cluster in the, the center that likely has uh, this case. This I would have to check for confirmation from with somebody else here, but probably, you know, formed out of the gas that we're seeing there and had actually carved out that central region. There's a reason we don't see as much uh, nebula in the, the center is much of a glow from the hydrogen because all those stars are starting to push away this cavity that uh, we're now seeing in the, the center of um, the Rosette Nebula here. I, I, I love the way that uh, Gary is uh, moving the pointer around as you're discussing this as if... Yeah, thank you, Gary. Yeah, that's yeah, fantastic, Gary. Well, that, really, yeah. that really helps out. I'm trying um, to keep up. <laughs> doing a great job. And, and so, I mean, again, there's one of these objects that we get to see now because it's this time of the year, and we'll have it for the next couple of months, and and really appreciate it, and probably bring it back every single time because, as you all know, it's my favorite. So it, it is uh, your favorite, and it's it something that favorite. was highlighted as well in the documentary that Google made about us for um, the yeah. I/O conference because it is it's amazing, it's beautiful, and it's something that, like you were saying earlier, is that it's only up during the specific point of time, and we love being able to. You know, just, just see the, the, the dust lanes and the gas that are, and it's just amazing all the detail that I was able to get out with your huge monster scope over here in L.A., but with your filter, you're able to get rid of the nasty light pollution as well. Yeah, now, I've key. moved on because I know that uh, Royce had this image up for quite a little while, and I want to uh, make sure that we appreciate it, and it, it is wonderful. It's very small, though, but... It's I'm gorgeous. Not... Is that the sombrero? That's NGC no. 281. Okay. It's Looks, some edge on this yeah, galaxy. I yeah, don't it's know a fantastic edge on galaxy. It's in Cassiopeia. The thing I like, about, I like most about this image is not necessarily that galaxy. It's the fact that there I've counted basically 15 other galaxies oh in this photo. Oh my gosh, I see where your pointer is. Yeah, there's yeah. There's one here. There's one here. 
There's one up here. Oh my God! You've got your own little deep field. I know. I was There's one there. there. Yeah. The the ray. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, yeah. What's up, Hubble? Survey. Roy's in the house. Yeah. We got the Roy <laughs> deep field survey. Uh, we got a request for M1 Crab Nebula, which is of course the. Did you uh, say 281? Uh, did you mean 891? 281. What did I take a picture of? <laughs> <laughs> the sky. It's 281. Uh, I think okay. is a nebula. Yeah. 891. 891, that's 891. what I thought. Yeah. 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 I get all those edge-ons confused. I thought it was NGC 4565 for a second, and there's just a, you know, a list of these things, <laughs> yeah. and they all look like this. Yeah. It's easy to get them confused. But, yeah, the thing so with this the is also and, called... Oh. Go ahead, Pamela. Sorry. Uh, this one's also called Caldwell 23, so this is one of the outstanding Southern Hemisphere objects to complement the Northern Hemisphere's Messier objects, and it's one of Herschel's discoveries from 1784. What uh, what constellation are we looking at again here? Because Cassiopeia Andromeda, like, I believe. Andromeda sounds yeah, better. it's Andromeda. Yeah. You can't annoying. really see galaxies in Cassiopeia. You'd be, be yeah. like, you're looking through. The That's what, Yeah, I was there. astonished. This, this yeah. actually can, I don't know why it's a Caldwell object because. It's a yeah, plus 42, plus. which just yeah. confuses right. me. But, hey, we but have it's a Caldwell M object, so I'll move on to play. We have M83, and we have you know, uh, these other things that don't make it much more than 30 degrees above the horizon from, from our latitudes in the Messier catalog. So uh, a little bit of crossover. right? So. Now, I've got a question and, and so here. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Miguel uh, Zapeda on uh, Google Plus. I've got a Nexstar 8 SE and have a Sony Handycam. How good images can I get with this equipment? Thought I would just sort of relate what we're doing to to uh, his question. So I'm not familiar with the Handycam. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know whether they use a Handycam. Well, just like a Sony like a video camera. Yeah, like a video camera, right? Yeah, yeah but you're not much electrical long to take exposures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you'd be able to do like the moon and uh, and planets and stuff, planets, but yeah. you wouldn't be able to do any longer exposures with a with a handy cam. So you you would probably want to use some kind of DSLR. Someone got a vacuum cleaner okay, going on in the background. There's something going on. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Sorry. Um, now I've seen a couple of requests for M1, so I don't know if. Uh, Parked in the crab nebula. Crab. The crab Gary. nebula. Oh, there we go. Gary it, did Gary. it. Oh my Gary god. Gary did it. There you go. Somebody I'm, asked for I'm, what up, crab oh, nebula? That's right here. it. I'm physic. I know what we're gonna be asked for. <laughs> you are physic, scary. Again, another one of the objects. And this, of course, is the uh, is the I guess the poster, the the image we've chosen for the uh, space community on Google Plus, which, by the way, is the largest community on all of Google Plus. It is. Uh, what with are we about at now? Eighty-three thousand. Eighty-eight thousand. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, it's a ma and, and it's it's beating Android by a long shot, which has about sixty-five. So yeah, no, it's quite right. a. Uh, yeah, eighty-three. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so thanks to everybody who's joining us from the space community as well. We're doing this for you and for everybody as well. But for you. and for ourselves. And for ourselves. Because... Well, actually, you know what? I mean, the the goal really was to try and start to host this out of the space community and try and integrate it into the space community. Right. But it's actually still kind of hard to do that within Google Plus. So, right. We're giving the feedback. We just back. cross post a lot. Wow. Yeah. So watch well, for our cross posting. Yeah. yeah. But we don't we don't want people to do that, and so we can't. Be a bad example of that, but but anyway. So if you no, haven't I mean, already, we, we we share all of our events on the communities. Yeah, I'm gonna mute Phil. There. <laughs> <laughs> and are, are they like drag racing like little bicycles over there? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure what they're it's doing. Oh, I don't think that was me. I, I I don't have a noise like there, that around here. There's a good question. Uh, someone's asking. Alan Davidson's asking. Can anyone point out the crab in the crab nebula? I don't. I don't understand. I I, I don't see it either. I don't see a crab. So, no, I've never seen it. And it's not in the constellation Cancer, is it? <laughs> yeah. So, well, it it was named before we had all these pretty shiny pictures. I mean, if you think about it, it was named when people were looking at it through low resolution telescopes. So, if you blur that out a little bit, you can see it as a soft shell crab with its legs tucked underneath. You know, Maryland right. summer. Yeah. It's the carapace of the crab. It's not the the, it's the, carapace. the legs and everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, then let's call it the trilobite nebula. I mean, come on. That's... <laughs> Isopod nebula. <laughs> <laughs> Phil is screen sharing uh, some recent dusty images of the crab nebula in the infrared. Since we've muted his Wookiee, I thought I should point that out. <laughs> <laughs> we we do love you, Phil. 
<laughs> the seat there. Okay. You you just gave us the name of this episode, uh, Nicole. This is the muted Wookiee episode. <laughs> it's actually the vacuum of space. Uh, sorry, I already um, trademarked that. That's my new that's my new pub I'm opening is Wookiee. I didn't uh, I didn't tell my wife that I was doing this, and so she's cleaning up right now. And... Uh, okay. <laughs> but I thought maybe you had call your wife a I'll get closer. Don't call your wife a Wookiee. You'll get in trouble. <laughs> Hill has just had this abundance of, of images here. I mean, he had the, an M42, M43, and Running Man Nebula up before. He's got the California Nebula up before. Can, can we get back to Bill so more than the few of us who can sure. like, click yeah. on him see it here? I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. he's, he's just bringing yeah. up this awesome stuff. So Okay, Bill, what have you got? Nicole, Right now I've got the California Nebula, which I took. I think it was the second one I took. Uh, unfortunately, a satellite was rude enough to go across the image uh, while I was taking it, but uh, other than that, it worked out. Normally, you would throw this out, right? Uh, well, yeah. Well, normally, you'd use data rejection, and it would automatically uh, keep the nebula part and the stars, and it would throw out the star track because it wasn't in the rest of them. The, the, it's a process called min-max rejection. So you take multiple images, so if you have five images, you take the pixels, throw out the two brightest, the one faintest, and average together the two that are remaining. Ideally, you want a lot more pixels than that. Reject the top two, reject yeah, the bottom usually, one, average all of these. usually dither them, and then you usually use yeah. a sigma reject. Uh, is at least what I do anyway. So essentially, astronomers are really elitist, and we reject a lot of things. Like, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. We're far too good <laughs> we for We don't that. like our Scott, data aberrant. Our data needs to be dead on. <laughs> But it's it's great that you're getting this in um, again in full color, right? I mean, this is not hydrogen alpha, and you're getting this nebulosity with your yeah. With your I mean, setup, it's it's, really it's got enough. I mean, there isn't much there other than red. In other words, you know, in the nebula itself. And let's see, you were saying Orion. I had another one of uh, yeah. where you had the is full it? Let me bring that up real quick. Orion's dagger. Yeah, there don't go. uh, don't keep going. I there's that one. And so, <laughs> and you just took this, right? Yeah, yeah, I just took that. Wow. <laughs> and again, that's two minutes. Interestingly, if you look down here, can anybody tell me what these two streaks are? You see them in this area a lot. Which head nebula is particularly uh, bad, if you want to call it for that? Are they uh, geosync satellites? Geosync satellites, yeah, geostationary yeah. satellites. Yeah. I know around yeah. uh, the around the Orion Nebula, you see them a lot. Yeah, you see them a lot. And again, data rejection will remove those for you, but... Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to take a star chart, an inappropriate chart program, you could probably tell which one of those, you know, whether it was DirecTV 5 or, you know, <laughs> Galaxy 7 or whatever, you know. We actually have an asteroid in a few weeks passing closer than GEO, uh, 2012 DA14, I think it is. Just a little closer than GEO. Wow. And there's 33 that I also took tonight. Sheesh, wow. <laughs> Yay for flocculence. Oh, <laughs> is that the flocculence uh, sign? Yes, this is my flocculence. <laughs> it's my favorite astronomy word. Yeah, it's a good but word. We were all three doing it last week. Although when I tend to do it, it's more Steve Martin, but... <laughs> rather, rather than Madonna, or... Right, so... I don't know, it reminds me of voguing rather than flocculence. I don't know, yeah. sorry. So. <laughs> um, I'm going to move on to Roy's view, because uh, I like it. Sorry, Roy's view. You mean Roy? No. Yeah, no, Roy, we already, we, Roy's already gone to <laughs> Hope Scope. Roy, what, what have we got? That is the and Flaming nice. Star Nebula, and uh, it's starting to shoot through clouds, so it's not uh, very bright. Oh, so it's a little bit of the uh, Flaming Star Nebula and a little bit of the clouds. No, it's the clouds. You don't see the clouds. It's just uh, the light's not coming through totally. They're really high clouds. When, when you have level cirrus, all it does is, is make it like you're looking through sunglasses. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little darker. It's, it's fuzzy. Yeah. That's great. Now, and actually, someone requested this, right? Uh, I don't know. Yes. I think I, I remember it. seeing that, but I... Yeah. So, I, did, uh, I did NGC 723, but it didn't come up very well. Mike requested um, it. So. Bill might be able to get NGC 7023 really good. Uh, Bill, have you, have you star, tried imaging could, yeah. the, the comet? Have you tried imaging um, K5? I haven't tried that, no. 
So you, no, we've had we've had such terrible weather here lately. Yeah. I just haven't really done much imaging. And plus, the fact I'm working on a mosaic project that I've been working on for three years now, and I kind of want to oh, wow. finish it up. <laughs> no way. What do you what, what are you what mosaicing? Are you mosaicing? It's the area above Orion. I'm using a 135 millimeter lens and an S big 11,000. So the the area is like several degrees by several degrees in hydrogen alpha with you know like 15 45 minute exposures on each one so with the wow. poor weather we have in the winter here all the time it's it's taken me a huge amount of time to get the darn things the dead data i need so this is part of what's known as barnard's loop correct the northern portion of it yeah exactly there's the there's uh, like th some interesting things there's a supernova remnant called uh, simiasis 147 there's a the what's called the uh, alien head nebula just above Orion, and it's all all pretty much part of Barnard's loop. Although there is some other stuff up there as well. Lambda Orionis, the um, there's a big old fuzzy ball around one of the stars above Orion too, and there was a there was an in far infrared picture of that released last year, or the year before, from a NASA telescope that's jaw dropping. If you look for that Lambda Lambda Orionis using the Wise telescope, anything through Wise is pretty awesome. But that one in particular was really cool. What, uh, what I love about this image is you have this cross area of fewer stars, and it's not that there's fewer stars, it's that there's dust that isn't illuminated like the dust right around the central star. What is this? <clears throat> this is the one that, uh, that, that Roy's got here. <clears throat> well, I know, but what is it? It's the iris. That is 7023, iris nebula. Yeah, that's the iris. It, it looks so much better in color. It's in Cepheus. Um, could you switch to color? Could you switch to color, Roy? <laughs> yeah, well, it, I could do it, but it take three times as long. <laughs> okay. Fraser, you actually posted a, a photo of this that I shot this past summer. Um, oh, should I go grab that? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me bring that. Oh, up. get your yeah. crayons out, Fraser. Somebody also had mentioned um, somebody in the comments here that uh, the first drawings of M1, the Crab Nebula, made it look like a crab. So we're we're getting it from sketches. Um, but yeah, let me go find my uh, my M uh, my NGC seventy twenty three. I've got a request for M eighty one, M eighty two, but I don't know if they're high enough. I can give a shot. They're pretty far north, <laughs> aren't up. they? Yeah, they're up. Yeah, yeah. but they can be pretty Probably. low, okay. depending on the time of year. Yeah, yeah. Try one. That would be great, Bill. That's from okay. Frederick. Beginning of Audrey. spring semester was that on our target to... list? I can't remember. Uh, let's go back to Jupiter while we uh, while we wait for for some more images to come up. We're caught up with the astronomers. I can't believe it. Even with all of our silliness, we're caught up. So, <laughs> so I'm going to appreciate this. And you can really see that moon now, over to the right of Jupiter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I did a check, and unfortunately, the great red spot isn't turned forward right now. It Ever. just went over the limb about, uh, That's about an hour oh. before we started. Oh, well. It's Fraser's fault. That always happens. <laughs> We've never seen it. Yeah. I mean, maybe we have seen it. We didn't remember that we should be looking for it. Are we in anti-resonance with the orbital <laughs> rotation of the spot oh, when we choose oh, Sunday maybe. evening, sunset, western oh. hemisphere? Is this Apparently, some math should, that we haven't looked into? Eventually. Brilliant. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I could see the other two moons here. Let me move over to the side a little bit. This is going to be just like last time. I do not see any moons. I don't see it either. Let me, let me over, Jupiter's about to get really overexposed. Yeah, overexpose it and we should yeah. see it. I'm going to show, yeah, uh, I'm going to show Thad's image there. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's one. Yeah, that was my, my Iris Nebula from last June there's 23rd. There's two. So. Oh, we're back to moons. Okay, yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see them, yeah. Can, can you keep overexposing it, Dave? Yeah, let me let me crank it up just a little more. Like just make wash out Jupiter, but we should really see those moons. Then I think I think the only one we're missing is Callisto. I think it's way off to the side. I did see it when I was looking at it visually a while ago. That Callisto always making trouble. Okay, I gotta give a shout out to Yancy Shirley who is watching the hangout. <laughs> Yay! Hi, Yancy. <laughs> I just noticed you popped up in the comments. We missed you at AAS. <laughs> yeah, that's uh. Astronomer out of Arizona. What's up? It's it's the UT alumni night. Amanda and hey. Yancy and I all three went there. There's cool stuff. There it is. That little dot dancing right there. That's great. Oh, I see. Is that Europa? <laughs> That's no, Callisto. Callisto. That's Callisto. Okay. Pretty sure it is. I've got a map I'm looking at. 
Uh, and it's kind of crazy with the Galilean moons. So, so what? Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto. If you want to remember them, it's I eat green carrots, or as I tell my students, I eat green cucarachas. They remember that pretty well. Um, but you get this huge variation from the ones that are nearby Jupiter, which have immense amounts of activity and constant resurfacing. And Callisto, which is one of the oldest surfaces in the solar system, that it's, it's estimated to be about 4 billion years old, that it hasn't had this kind of crazy activity, geologic activity going on like the, um, like the more inner moons of, uh, of Jupiter. I eat green chili. <laughs> So well, Bill's brought a new uh, a okay. new image back up. Oh, it's another rosette. <clears throat> another rosette. It's color. Whoa. A little bit faint, but it's it's yeah. shows the H alpha. Uh, Gary, can you bring back your rosette image? I know you you've just put up another image, but I'd yeah, love this... to see the the comparison because this is where the oh, H alpha okay. really shines in in Gary's view. You can really see all the faint details. Yeah, well, Gary gave us a, a much wider view of Jupiter. Yeah. Here. Oh, get, oh, 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 right. Okay, yeah. Oh. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. But you can just see the, uh, you can see just the the comparison. You can just see how much. So in the H alpha, just how much detail there is, and then with the, with Bill's view, it's just it's faint and, and just a subtle colors of purple. It's just beautiful. But you can see those dust lanes there, between the two images. So it sort of yeah. gives you a chance to orient it. I want to say. I was going to do this before, um, but we moved we moved on too quickly. Um, <laughs> what I've got screen shared here is a um, a picture of that same nebula from the Wise Telescope, which is a deep, a far infrared telescope. So what is what's dark in the optical images and the visible light images is actually bright in these. So you can actually and, and you get a more of a three dimensional view. You can actually sort of mm -hmm. see the, the the fact that these stars are eating out. The center of the nebula, and and, and you, there's a big cavity in there. I I love pictures like this. Yeah. You learn you can learn a lot by looking at a single image, but when you start looking at different wavelengths, it's amazing what uh, what happens when you compare them. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, oh, Gary, can we go back to that Jupiter image that you had there? Because yeah. that was fantastic. Yeah, just to show the uh, in perspective. And then I think we'll. It's uh, we're, we've crossed our hours. So I think it's time to start to start wrapping things up. Oh, there they are. So th that just shows you Gary's field of view, just how yeah. big that field of view is, how much of the sky you can look at. But it's Gary's field of view that makes it so much easier to start calculating orbital velocities of the moons and thus the mass of Jupiter. And and what's awesome is it was a view similar to this that that Galileo used to realize that. Our, our sun isn't our our sun and Jupiter and all of these different things are are affected in similar ways and that's all kind of awesome. Not everything goes around the sun or the Earth specifically because Jupiter has its own things that are going around it. And that but if it goes around, right. it comes around. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have and, the and for Galileo, it, go ahead. All right. Well, why don't we why don't we we'll wrap up tonight's star party on uh, on the request? So somebody asked for M eighty one, M eighty two. Here's M eighty one. Very nice. M eighty one in the middle, M eighty two here, and in a couple other galaxies as well. There and there. And this one is not flocculating. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you look at uh, neutral hydrogen, I'm going to go find that now. Yeah, but but Go this Nicole. is why we classify everything in the B filter because when you switch filters, they all look different. Of course. So, oh, so and and M eighty two. Oh, sorry, just to mention M eighty two. That's over to the right of of uh, Bill's field of view here. This is also a starburst galaxy. So massive amounts of star formation because that big spiral in the middle is messing with M eighty two gravitationally. It's like yeah. so those tidal interactions are causing huge numbers of stars to form. So you know, this and and here's Gary's view, which is uh, flipped. Yep. Of the same object, so we get double. Wow. And this is H alpha. So in here we're seeing more of the, the concentrations of hydrogen gas instead. And and you can start to see in in Gary's image how disturbed that galaxy on the left is. And this is one that's really worth looking up the multi wavelength images and it's starting to see the destruction and how the destruction leads to X rays and and jets and all these amazing different things that makes studying astronomy across the entire electromagnetic spectrum so important. Well, why don't we uh, let's Hang wrap on. things up. What? No. Hang on. I'm, I'm, 
I will tell you what, I will start to wrap things up and you can post a picture. If you there we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> Is it flocculating now? I had to show it, it actually flocculates when you look at it with a radio telescope. And so, uh, although you, when we're looking at our optical images, um, you don't see them directly interact in M81 and M82. When you look at the neutral hydrogen gas, which you can see with the radio telescope, that lets you see further out into the disk, and so you can actually see the hydrogen from those two galaxies interact. There is some nomming going on. I had to show <laughs> the hey. galaxy noms. Yep. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to wrap this up then because I think I suspect we could keep this up all night. Uh, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> Bill, well, Bill, thank, thank, you, thank you very much for uh, for sharing your view from from Oregon and your enjoyed doing today. it. That Glad was, the weather was decent and, for a change. And that was a phenomenal pictures. setup. Like like, and I know it was way less work for you this time around than it has been in previous uh, times when you're you know merging images together. So. So do this again. I, I think it was perfect. We will plan on it. All right. And David, thank end, you very much. We're going to end on Roy's photo right, there. Thanks. I we're will, I will, yeah. 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 So David, thank you very much again yeah, and thanks. thanks for braving the mosquitoes and the and the warm Florida weather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much Gary for uh for bringing your scope as well. I really appreciate it. Quite, Glad quite you got the good weather this it. week. Yeah. Um there's Nicole with the purple hair completely. Oh, she was uh frozen for a second there. <laughs> I'm here. Still frozen. It's pink. Hear Still you. frozen. Yeah, we can hear you though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dr. Pamela Gay, as always, thanks for coming. Dr. My Phil pleasure. Plate, thanks for coming. Thanks. And bringing the Wookie. What are we? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get in so much muted, trouble the, with the Mrs. Muted. BA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Didn't hear the part about the Wookie. <laughs> yeah, uh, Scott, thanks for coming. Thank you. And Dr. Thad Zabo as well. We got a lot of doctors today. One. To doctor, are you doctor. Doctor, 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 doctor? All right. Well, I'm going to wrap this up on on Roy Salisbury's image. Another wonderful view of the uh, of the rosette. Look at that. All right. Well, thanks everybody, and we'll see you okay. all. Uh, we'll see you all next week. All right. Take it easy. Good night. 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 Good night.